Okay. You got your stuff ready? Yeah, yeah. we are ready. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, Reverend Salisworth, we want to just get some a little bit more information on that day, that infamous day at Phillips High School. <laughs> How did that happen? What, what was the circumstances? Well, you remember that uh, previously I had uh, sent the superintendent a letter with about uh, oh, eight or ten type pages. We were kind of said that, uh, well, Shelworth could have got this out of telephone book. Uh -huh. So within a week I had, I believe it was 11 or 12, or maybe more than that, written ink in ink uh -huh. from parents. Right. It showed that uh, it was time, I guess, in Birmingham. And the superintendent uh, didn't want to answer as we wanted to. And I knew that uh, with the segregationists, it could forever meet on time with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or never, it meant sometime. Right. So that uh, I had not got uh, the answer I desired from the superintendent. And so I said, we're going to enroll our students. You know, I'm an actionist anyway. Mm -hmm. And all of my plans were to embarrass segregation. Never to harm any person, but to embarrass the segregation. Mm -hmm. And not let them get set so they could do it that way, mm -hmm. their way. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I would take my children, two daughters, the oldest daughters, Patricia and Ruby for the record. And at that time we had... Uh, Mother Horton of the movement, she was the oldest woman at that time in the movement, in her 90s, but she had this son, Nathaniel. Mm -hmm. I believe it's Nathaniel Lee. Nathaniel Lee. Okay. And of course, uh, Rowan Pfeiffer was, was the driving, I asked Pfeiffer to drive. I asked Woods to drive first, and Woods was a little nervous. He had Richard too. He said, well, he started, well, I, 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 Pfeiffer said, I'll drive. Woods said, yeah, yeah, Pfeiffer, you drive. <laughs> And we was watching from about a block away. The father drove me uh, right up to the front of the stairs. And there were people, because I had announced it on radio and TV, that I was going to try to enroll them. So there were several clansmen, at least maybe 10 or 15. There were at least three policemen, so that they really could have stopped it had they wanted to. Mm -hmm. This policeman, uh, I remember, came up to the first man who touched me or grabbed me or whatever. And this policeman said to him, oh, now you don't want to do that. Instead of saying, get back or blah, blah, blah. That's mm -hmm. policemen usually do. Mm -hmm. I really think they intended to let them get to me. And they did. Mm -hmm. So my wife got out the back first and uh, the girl was trying to get out. I think that, that they slammed the door on the girl's uh, foot. And my wife had one of those, at that time, one of those thick rubbery girdles that women wore. Mm. And a clamor had a swift bearing knife. He just stuck it in her hip. She didn't even know she was having stuck with a knife until the doctor, we were at the hospital, and the doctor was attending to me. Mm -hmm. So the, this door that was open, and I said to people, we better get a little more guard on our mind and see where we can understand he is, what he is, who he is, what he can do. At this time, that door, when, so I got out. This is a car door. Yeah, my 57 plumbers with the state took from me. Oh, by the way, Alabama owes me a car. Some of y'all got a remind me. <laughs> I never got it back. Uh, but I did take the tires off so the camera got the police to take it, pump it up. Mm. Uh, That's a little joy for me. You know, <laughs> bit. And, and uh, so the, the climbing came as soon as I got out the car and grabbed my coat and pulled it up over my head. So if I, somebody asked me, was I fighting? I said, no, if I couldn't afford it, if I had wanted to, which I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and they took me, oh, I guess at least 25 or 30, maybe 40 feet down the sidewalk, kicking, pummeling, mm -hmm. cursing, as vicious as dogs when they're fighting. So they attacked you immediately when and the car Pull up. When the car pulled up within um, within 30 seconds, I was being attacked. And five of those didn't pull off. Wood said he would have gone on by left. 
But by the grace of God, that door was kept open as I would have died on that sidewalk. And uh, so they took me down maybe 30, 40 feet, kicking, stomping, knocking me down. I had that gray suit on, a big hole was scrubbed in my knee right there. And, it, and one of them struck me with a, a some object on my wrist. I thought it was broken. And uh, they were cursing. And you you know now that uh, one of the clans, the last clan who was convicted here last year, was in the very first bombing of my church, he and uh, the man that died in prison. Uh, and so I didn't know it was he. Uh, I just heard white men cussing. And they were saying words like, let's kill this SOB. I don't mean sweet old boy. <laughs> let's kill him right now and it'll all be over. And they kept saying that two, three times. Mm -hmm. And then one of them said, we missed him last time. Mm -hmm. But if we kill him today, it'll all be over. They thought about killing me. Which means it wasn't, or the last time had to be nothing else but the bombing, you right. see. And we learned from that that he was in the bombing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oh, chains, first time I saw grass now because I was being struck with him. Chains, uh, pipes, mm -hmm. bats. Did you have any idea of what Reverend Pfeiffer was doing? Did he tell you what he was doing during all of this commotion? You know, it was an amazing thing. I don't ever remember us talking about it. But he was committed. Pfeiffer wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. And they didn't try to bother the car once they had me. They mm -hmm. concentrated on me. They took my wife in the hip and she got back in the car. Mm -hmm. So that uh, they were satisfied. The Lord, they were. They intended to K-I-M-L me mm -hmm. that day. Right. But thank God. You were the target. I was the target. The children wife. were not the target. No, no. Mm -hmm. They didn't even bend the car. They didn't even touch the car anymore. Mm -hmm. And that car sat there with the door. There had been anybody else they were taken off. Thank God for, you know, he won't leave you anyway, you know, he says. Mm -hmm. I try to tell people all that when I see it. And then, uh, so I, as they were striking me, my swimmers, Bridget, tell them, tell them, tell something in the morning. Uh, every time they would hit me on the head with brass knuckles or chain, I'd, I'd experience a bit of grayness in my brain. I see kind of great. Uh, did anything knock me out? And I guess I must have been struck several times. And I began to realize when I was about 30 feet away, I had to get back to the car, else I would be knocked unconscious on the street. But as I said on the film who speaks for Birmingham, a mob is so uh, constructed that they run into each other, trying to hurt, harm their target. They, I expect some of them might have got struck with their own blow, chains, brass, nothing. And everybody was trying to get to me. And in that melee, I kept my eyes on the, 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 the car because after I'd been struck several times, I began to realize I had to get to the car if I was going to live. And on the way back to the car, I'd gotten, I guess, maybe 25 feet, I began, I saw a man sitting at the door of the car. Swinging the chain. Mm -hmm. And remember, my, my, my vision was getting a little hazy. And by that time, one man struck me again. And I was trying to make up my mind how I was going to get by this man. And I said, well, all I could do is run into him somehow. Or other. Maybe Pfeiffer could grab me. He said, right at the end of the car, I had to go by him, swinging the chain. And, uh, but somehow or another, by the grace of God, by their own mm -hmm. maneuvering or mismaneuvering, he wasn't there. So I stumbled on into the car and fell up into the car with both my hands in front of me. I didn't. I, I just fell up into the car. Five for reached over and took my hand and pulled me further into the car. And if you, that film would show, if you could see it, that when I left, if my feet, the door was open. My feet were still outside the car when I went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's another story. When I got there, uh, they assigned two nurses, two white young ladies, to clean me up, and I was scrubbed off. My skin was scrubbed off. I found out then I was white as anybody else under my skin. And I was hurting right here a little bit. I thought my wrist was broken. And one of the white girls was saying, damn if I let somebody, I mean, why in the hell would anybody want to 
get into this. What fool was she? She was really trying to say something. And she, I, she said, why? Well, why would you do? I said, well, you wouldn't understand if I told you. And so she kept on talking to other girls. I said, well, now, this isn't your job to ask them question. Right. You hit it and clean up so the doctor can see. These were two white nurses. Two white nurses, yeah. yeah. So he already told you. If he told you, you wouldn't understand, and you wouldn't. It ain't our business. So she did good and said, well, so finally the doctor comes in. I'm laying there like a skip pee. And one of the other things that you should know is all of the people that were ambulatory who saw the his witnesses on TV, they were walking up and down the hall. Mm -hmm. It was a peculiar day. And the doctor came and he apologized. He felt so sorry about it. He said, I really am sorry. I said, well, doctor, this was designed to be. You don't have to apologize for this. And this had to be. He said, well, I can understand. I said, so you don't have to apologize to me. It was something neither of us could have prevented. And, uh, but it had to be done. God's will to be done. And so he took me, he said, well, let me look at you. He said, you must have at least some kind of concussion. I think that's a big crack. At least you have to have some contusion. I think that's a small crack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he looked my head and we bust up. I said, doctor, the Lord knew I lived in a hard town, so he gave me a hard spell. And when he examined me, amazingly, my pulse was known, having just come out of a mob. And my blood pressure was down. He said, mm. this is terrific. I said, yes, sir. It is. I said, because God's in charge. Mm. So he examined me and he found that he didn't, he didn't see any, uh, he didn't see any cracks or anything, which amazed him. And he said, uh, well, do, you, uh, do you feel hurt? I said, I'm, I said, I'm just a little wounded, but I'm all right. And he said, well, I need to observe you. I said, well, now, doctor, if you order me into the hospital, you have to have two policemen on the outside door and two on the inside. I said, I'm sure you can't do that. He said, well, no, I really can't do that. I said, doctor, if I go home, I, I will die with my friends. If I go home and die, I die among my friends. But over here, I cannot control the circumstance of my death. So I choose to go home if you can't keep me safe over here. He said, well, I understand, and I can't do that. He said, but if you have the least bit of trouble, uh, you call me. Well, I remembered one thing, that when I did finally get to the car, one time he kicked me in the side, and probably two, three drops of blood in my urine. And I had told the doctor that, he said, now, you told me that the blood was in the urine, he said, the least thing happened, you have any pain anywhere, you call me and I'll come to you if you can't come back to me or something like that, he said. Mm -hmm. But I was glad he wasn't going to try to make me stay in the hospital because I knew that if nonviolence would not work that day, it would never work. So my, my point in going home was to go home and just relax a little bit and come back to the mass meeting, which they rub in stones said that night. That cross the I believe, on 30 some Street up there. Mm -hmm. uh, New Hope, I believe. Uh. And so I went home and sort of relaxed. And uh, that afternoon, I decided to wear the same clothes that, that they had booked up. There was a big hole almost the side of my hand, my knee. I don't know, they must have swelled me and dragged me on the ground or something. Mm -hmm. Part of the way. And so I put that as a light gray suit with stripes. And uh, so I put that on. And I think I was driven because I had my arm in a sling to keep the weight off, keep it from hurting. And, and, and I guess people thought my arm was broke. So when I got to the church that night, I said, take the bull by the horns and really tackle the idea of nonviolence. And so I didn't intend to stay. Normally when I go in, I would sit in, in the chair behind the pulpit. And tonight, I sat in the chair to the right of the pulpit at the edge of the stage where everybody could see me. And boy, those people, when I got there, they were, on the outside was so tears of people. It was all around, maybe 10, 12 deep. Mm -hmm. 
and they were saying some words that you don't say in Sunday school. <laughs> well, when I got in church, they were saying some un Sunday school words also. They were angry. Right. And so I sat down and I said, well, uh, normally I sit here, but I, I'm a little bit under the weather tonight, as everybody can see. And they were saying some words, the women were saying bad to men. I said, well, I guess it's some mad folk in here tonight. Yeah, yeah. I said, I said, who all mad in here tonight? They said, yeah. everybody was saying, I said, all the mad folks stand up. So the women and men, well, I'm the only one sitting down. I said, that's strange. I said, I said, now, I was beaten up and I'm not angry at all. I said, in fact, you know, that's what we prayed to that. We prayed we were going to get hurt, but we weren't going to hurt anybody else. I said, I agree, and I came tonight. That's what I really came to talk to you about. I said, there'll be, there'll be no violence in this city, uh, man. I said, first of all, when we were dismissed, we're going straight to our homes. Don't necessarily go through the white neighborhoods unless you must. And if you go through, I don't want to blast, broken, I want to burst tonight in this city. I said, in fact, uh, I'm directing everybody. Before that, I had asked them to stand up, all those who got beaten. I said, now, I, I got beaten and I'm not angry. So all those who got beaten up today stand up. We may have reason to be angry. So, did nobody stand up? I said, I said nobody ain't got beaten up and y'all that mad? I said, we're going to be nonviolent. And even if we got beaten up, we ain't going to be violent. And I said, I really mean that tonight. And that's one of the reasons I came to let you see me and to know that I'm all right, I'm not angry. And tonight, there'll be no violence in this city at all. Well, I'm not even a glad to go. I said, furthermore, you tell the folk on the outside, so I want to talk again. When they, when we dismiss, go straight home. And more than that, I am directing anybody who sees someone else throw a rock bust the one or do any damage at all against anybody at home, black or white. I'm, I'm directing them to report to me so in the morning when I get up, I go down to the police station and have them arrested. We must be nonviolent in the city. Mm. And that night, I have never had to stand up and caution people about nonviolence again. They were ready to tear the town up that night. Mm. And I think that's one of the things I'm most grateful for that the practice of nonviolence was even if the philosophy that they didn't understand. And so I explained to them later, and even I said, well, nonviolence isn't about it. So you can't read the fifth chapter of Matthew and be violent. And even John the Baptist, he was talking to the soldier. Everybody came and said, what can we do that we might work the way of Christ? He said, do violence to no man. you got an opportunity. You take advantage. He said, don't take advantage. And this was what Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about. Uh, I think Jesus put it in words like this, in your patience, possess your souls. And if people ever learn the discipline of trying to act like Christ, Peter said, talked to him when he's being hung on the cross and, and everything. He said, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And so, you know, as I speak to you today, I thank God that I've learned so many things. I learned how to forgive. I learned how to have compassion on other people. I learned to empathize with people who don't sympathize or empathize with me. And I learned you just have to be bigger than your situation, which may or may not be acceptable to you at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we say, Lord, I want to be like Jesus, but we never try to act like him. <laughs> yeah. And so the church falls short in so many ways. Mm -hmm. We are the soldiers. We are supposed to be battlefield soldiers. Right. Well, Reverend Sean, was, was this the first time since the Brown decision that there was an attempt to enroll black children into schools in Birmingham? Uh, no, in Birmingham. In Birmingham. Because Little Rock, you remember, right. happened before. And yeah. Judge Aaron was castrated him and they said, no, to send a special message to me that there'll be no integration. Yes, that was the, that was the first problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, is that uh, mm -hmm. good enough? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the Brown decision itself. Brown decision Wait. itself, 
gave all of us hope. I remember seeing it as I walked down about the federal courthouse, the old post office then. I said, U.S. Supreme Court outlawed segregation. And made, that made me feel like I had gotten a new religion. It inspired all that was in me. And I said to myself, now we can be, we can be men like other folk. And we can begin to be men and lead. Uh, and I said that God has spoken. The same court that wrote the wrong decision is now corrected by this. And I guess what it did to me was to make me more determined than ever that uh, I wouldn't stop until segregation was dead or either I was dead. That was my determination. Excuse me, that, that commitment to see change where segregation was concerned, and especially after the Brown decision, that uh, sort of gave some emphasis because even after that, you had the Montgomery bus boycott. Gave much interest to me. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and you must remember the, the night, the first first night of the boycott, I was there. Mm. I listened, observed, and we offered our services and movement. And of course, we got together, uh, come together to the organization, to allow the to allow the organization to be a civic affairs association. Mm -hmm. The Birmingham movement, as you remember, was the first, was as strong as anything. Mm -hmm. right. I kept going for seven years before I invited Martin Luther King here for the mass demonstration. Right. And I always thought that this was God moving in human history. Mm -hmm. and, and when he begins to move, things do change, no matter how long they've been in, in, in curriculum or in anything for, that people would do. Oh, no. And I always think of that song in my choir saying sometimes, right on came Jesus, no man can hinder thee. I felt all those emotions. Mm -hmm. And just not seeing anything yet in a long time, you know, before desegregation or mm -hmm. anything else. Yeah. But I thought, well, it, I, I knew that God was active in human affairs. Mm -hmm. And ever since I was a small boy, I believed in an awesome God, mm -hmm. a mercy and love, but of justice. And I thought that was a weakness on the part of the church to always sing about God's grace and mercy, especially without preaching also the justice of God. Mm. And that's why we have got justice in this world in all of these days. As for the Supreme Court decision, as good as it was, it didn't, I think, I think if I, you ask me a mistake about it, we're talking about the school. Uh, I thought the Supreme Court uh, made the mistake of not really demanding that the schools immediately begin to segregate. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the biggest mistake, because when the court speak, it ought to speak with clearing of all situations, even if it mandates certain steps. It did not mandate certain steps. Yeah. See, mm -hmm. as rapidly as possible or something like that. Yeah. And the Southerners about segregation was not going to do anything rapidly but keep blacks down, if, even if it took the Klan to mm -hmm. kill them. Yeah, well, the 55 decision did say with it, all delivery it was, speed. Yeah, with all delivery, but it didn't define delivery speed. Right. To segregation, delivered speed means never. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then the, the Brown decision, the bus uh, boycott, Montgomery bus boycott, the outlawing of the NACP led them to the to organizing in a few, just a few days, it wasn't two weeks. Mm -hmm. One Tuesday when they outlawed uh, May 26th, I believe, mm -hmm. NACP. But June 5th, which wasn't two weeks, I had followed God's direction, it had to be God's direction. Mm -hmm. Tell me to call the mass meeting. Mr. Shaw said to me, well, now, you know, I was an injunction. He's trying to be positive, bless his soul. Mm -hmm. He said, you probably ain't joking, you go to jail. I said, Mr. Shows, it looked like jail, here I come. <laughs> and I didn't realize then how many times I'd go to jail, nor did I really care. Mm -hmm. And Lubbers, Lucinda Brown wrote me, the only black teacher that dared affiliate with the movement to find the school board, and they didn't bother her. Mm -hmm. She said, yes, this is the black prince of peace. She was, 
I guess he recognized that God was moving in human history. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they never... They never yeah. doctor Sarah, father, or even friend of father. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't open in the movement, as you know. Mm -hmm. Her picture was everywhere in the movement was. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a thing that I don't really understand this moment. Especially having Bull Connor as a <laughs> champion of segregation. Sure. That's about the only thing that I know that really got through without anybody but. Mm. And you must never forget it was the school children that, that, that really broke the back of segregation here in Birmingham. Right. People think it was the men and women or college students, no. The Bible meant a lot when it said, a little child shall lead them. Mm -hmm. And I would go as far enough to say that the violence that we face now is because we didn't deal with violence effectively and thoroughly during the Civil War. We allowed the South to come back to make its own laws, states' rights, mm -hmm. meant no rights for blacks. Right. We were still fought 1894 edict that Negroes had no rights that blacks had to, mm -hmm. that whites had to respect. Right. And so, um, I'm blessed, I think, to be able to see some of your works that which change history begin to occur. I don't think that we have in any way done all we could and not nearly as far. If Eisenhower, when the Supreme Court spoke, had said, President Eisenhower had said, it's the law of the land, you have to obey it. But he made a, a stupid statement. I don't comment on any of their decisions as if their decisions was nothing important. Right. It was their business. Mm -hmm. But the same person was forced to put truth into Little Rock. Exactly. So that should say to wise people, particular people in power, you don't use your power for the right, you have to use it to, to, to deter mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. Another thing about this, in this education piece, it's not generally known, I said to the reporters, they don't pick it up. But uh, after Martin, in the demonstration, you know, the children did. But after the demonstration, I had the feeling that Martin and Ralph were just beat, you know, the Southern, when they said, maybe, they, they meant never. They never intended, even with the, all of the negotiations, to get rid of segregation. Mm -hmm. In fact, I always thought segregation was more important to the segregationists than going to heaven after you left. And uh, so when we found it, and you know, Martin came close to messing up. The middle class folk in the federal government, Rick Marshall, came down to try to get him to leave with the jails full. Right. And I never had a chance to talk with him about it. And I knew that they didn't try to call him on the door. I have been struck with fire holders. Mm -hmm. And I, the doctor gave me two high poles, as you know the story. I first got to the hospital, a high pole to make me rest. I, you need rest. I said, I don't think I need the kind of rest you're talking about. And about nine at night, he came back and gave me another because I hadn't responded. He thought I'd be sleeping. I'm wide awake. Mm -hmm. So he gave me another and I resisted that one too. And then next morning, it was a critical day in Birmingham. Because if I had not, well, I think Bobby Kennedy recognized that if they did come up with a board that I didn't agree to, it would be terrible because he knew my history and I right. did what I said I was going to do. The frail one. The frail, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, so Reverend Gardner, my vice president, and my wife came to the hospital to get me early that morning to see me, rather. And the doctor came in a while later. He said, well, you know, you might as well take him to back over to the motel. So his mind is over there. I said, now, doctor, you are a man of wisdom. That's where I belong. And when I got in my bed at room 24 at Gaston Motel, he took me in so nice, you know. <laughs> And the young, I hadn't been in the bed 10 minutes before Andy Young came by the knock on the door. Fred Martin wants you to come out to John Drew's house, which literally just set me on fire to get about a sick bed. They hadn't even come to see me that night to come out to 
middle class. When I say middle class, I don't do it with disrespect because I was friends with all of them. I just did my thing and let them do their thing. I do, didn't do that thing. Mm -hmm. But I always practice whenever Martin and Ralph called me, I'd go. Even later than that, some special things happen. And when I get out there, if you want me to tell that story. Mm -hmm. Rick Marshall was there, so it was close, right across the tape, closer than you and I. I think two white people were there from his staff. Martin always looked out the back window with out the window with his back hands in his back pocket. That was his anybody he would be troubled about something, he would do that. And I walked into John Drew's house and Good level, so you go down one or two steps. You go way over there and Miss Drew, real life, was sitting on her other steps. And I stumped into she right down into the King Arthur steps. And I was burning angry. And Marvin was looking out there, he didn't even look around. I said, Martin, why is it? I must get out of my sick bed and come out of John Drew's house. And he didn't say anything. I said, Martin, I know you understand and you hear me. Why must I get out of my sick bed and come out of John Drew's house? And with such pain, my friend, the merchants, no, he said, first he said, my friend, God can call a demonstration law, which infuriated me even more. I said, say that again, Mark. And Ms. Drew broke in. She told me, oh, I want to know why we can't call it off. And I let her have both of her. I said, well, hell, you didn't call nothing on, and you can't call nothing off. And Martin, the answer is, no, we don't call so-and-so thing off. <laughs> I don't like it either the other Sunday day up in New York. And he always said real words, but I don't believe in cussing in the church. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't like to say it even now. It, was, it, it isn't a beautiful thing to practice saying slang words. But I did tell him, hell no, we weren't going to call nothing off. Well, Ralph was sitting down right back of Martin as he looked out, and he was a little further in from here, that wall. And I said, now, Martin, people say you do this, get people in trouble and run them off. He said, where you are not to say I said, well, your own brother says, and other people. I said, but here, people trust me. I have suffered with them and now. And the jails are now uh, got full, and they were full at that moment because they trust me. They trust you because they trust me. I said, we damn sure ain't gonna call nothing up. And uh, one of the people said, what about the press conference? They were going to press conference, President and Washington and Martin, simultaneously. I said, what about the press I said, oh, y'all gonna have a press conference. I said, well, go ahead, y'all got to have it. I said, you Mr. Big Man, but you'll be Mr. The Other Wood, which I don't choose to say. And, um, So Martin said, but we got to have me. And then I, I attempted to get up and go. I said, well, y'all go ahead and do your thing. Oh, y'all going to be messing this. Especially you, Martin. And I tried to get up, and I found I couldn't. So I just sat back down, and I turned and let them have both bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, Mark Marshall didn't say but two things the whole Situation. He said, they're looking with his eyes wide open on me. I don't think he better than that. Looking like I'm Jesus, he said. But I have made promises to these people. That's all he said. And I said to him, very calm, not angry, not just. But any promise that you made in Birmingham that I did not agree to is not a promise. So I tried to get up again, I found it, and then I just really got mad. I said, but hell, go ahead and do what you're going to do. Well, Robert Kennedy always did this kind of work, because I was sitting in his office when Mary was put in Mississippi. He was 
So everything he figured that they had got me consoled with, I would have to agree or something. And so the phone rang, and fortunately the door was went where you could, went out right by me and it just opened into the room. And I know two times God had extended my hearing. First of all, he put the water on me before I went to the hospital. And I had come by where they were, sitting there with the tripod across from the church. And the policeman said to me, three or four, and we were friendly, I was friendly at that time. He said, well, you got them all afraid? I said, yeah, I think I got them all. And uh, he said, how far did you go? Well, I think Bill and them had gone to the fourth avenue, but I went to the third, I went to see them. Yeah, kids go to the front mm -hmm. sometimes. So when I got through, I was later than everybody else getting back to the church, and so I had a chance to talk to them. And I walked right in front of the tripod where they were. And uh, so when I walked in front of the tripod, I said, am I going across the street? And then I to the church. I went diagonal across from them to the church. And when I got practically on the top step of getting ready to go out in the basement, one of them almost whispered, just put some water in the like I'm talking now, and I heard it clearly. Mm -hmm. And when I looked up, he'd already turned the whole, the water had already, it was arcing down. And I just turned my back and put my hand in front of my face, that's my face would be destroyed today. And it slammed me against the wall, and there again I knew God was. This is in the button, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I was slammed, I, I, I think I was not temporarily unconscious, but the water itself was cold, you see. In the Bible, and then I heard somebody come to me. Oh, here, yeah, let me tell you what they came and got me. And I went to the hospital. At that time, you know, Bull Connor was approached with a quote on mic, open mic. And I said, Mr. Connor, did you hear the Reverend Charlotte Reverend? He struck the fire hose. He said, Damn, I went out, I've been there to see it. He knows he's talked to it. Where is it now? He said, uh, They took him to the hospital in an ambulance. Mr. Connor said, I wish they had carried me in a hearse, dead, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, back to the point, I had said to Marlon Rath, and I think we would have done well because at this time, the victory in Birmingham, would, as, a, as a song that said, each victory helps you some other victory to win. You know, when you win. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I think, well, I could have gotten, gotten you to sign anything. First, it wouldn't sign nothing. Mm -hmm. It was a marvel that I got them to sign a petition for school. So I had talked to Martin Raff. I said, now why we got this up? We ought to go ahead and integrate the school. I said, because when kids come up, play together, be together, uh, that's the way it ought to be. And they made me a specific problem. But they wanted to go to Selma, you see, which was right. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess one person there will have all he wants. Mm -hmm. And I really tried to get them to integrate the schools while we were here. We could have got thousands of petitions right around the school, so they go live right up close around the school. Right. And I said to them, why all the whites can't move out. And if we integrate the school, that's one of the things I wish that we could do over, but it probably wouldn't have worked. I don't think Martin's heart was in it at that time. I think he was glad that we could come to some sort of compromise. And to show you how reluctant and recalcitrant the whites were, it was a long time before they even began to do what they signed to do. Right. And I think, I think Martin was on down, but you have to give him credit. He, he was at the front of the movement. And he got to where, because I was always pressing. He, he didn't talk to me sometimes for two, three days at a time. Mm -hmm. And and I wonder sometimes now, we have talked about God and his struggle. What would have happened had they come to me at, at, as friends in the hospital at night? I might would have agreed that we could call them over to But if we had called them over to we never, never would be where we are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because when Bert said they are going, oh, I didn't tell you, I was going, Bert said they are going to agree to you, man, after I got ready to go. 
But don't worry, Fred, that's the second one. They are going to agree to your demand. Mm -hmm. The reason I know they agree is because I, the next one, I'm the one who began reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess people should learn that whatever is deepest in your heart, whatever you really believe God and didn't have no doubt about it, which I had none, mm -hmm. you ought to do that. Well, appreciate you sitting down, and I want to I want to hear that story again every every week. Can you come back every week and do it for us? Ah, well, you know, I live to glorify God and to glorify God. Yeah. Remember, if I got joy out of fighting the battle, I certainly get joy out of talking about what God has done. That's right. Thanks, friend. Appreciate it. Okay.